Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And we'll get right to the program this morning. We'll begin our reading and discussion of the book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy, by Michael DeSemlian. Yesterday on the program, uh, we began on page 5, uh, speaking of Daniel's little horn. Daniel spoke specifically about the papacy, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and he called him the little horn. And remember, Daniel also tells us that the Roman Empire would crumble, would deteriorate, and be divided into ten kingdoms. Okay? He also called those little kingdoms, or little kings, horns, didn't he? Okay? So when he describes the papacy as that little horn, he in fact is a little king. Horns are kings in Daniel's prophecy. So this little horn, this little king, uh, is described elsewhere in the Bible as the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And Daniel goes forward in describing the identifiable characteristics of this little horn so that we wouldn't be mistaken about who it is. You see, God doesn't play treacherously with the people for whom he died. He wants us to know his son, and he also wants us to know the counterfeit of his son, this little horn that Daniel spoke about. What are some of the defining characteristics of this little horn? Well, first of all, that he would uproot three of the ten kings, the kingdoms into which the Roman Empire collapsed. And he history records those for us, those three kings kill, uh, uprooted by the little king. The papacy were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Okay? What is another defining characteristic of this little horn of Daniel? Well, that he would wear out the saints of the Most High. And history records. And even to this day, we experience the, the wearing out of the saints of the Most High. As a matter of fact, few even resist the papacy anymore. They've been deceived and believe the papacy is no longer the Antichrist. And we've been completely worn out. We're not just war out, we've been massacred. We've been made war against by this little king in Rome. Okay? What are some of the other defining characteristics of this little horn? Well, he's diverse from all the ten kings that preceded him. What makes him diverse or different from the others? He represents God on earth, he says. He's not just a temporal king. He's a spiritual king the overseer of the souls of every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's something that no other king in the history of the world has ever claimed. Okay? He's diverse from the first. He's different. What other defining characteristics? Well, first of all, he has a mouth speaking great things. We just named one of them, claiming to be the spiritual overseer of every man, woman, and child on the planet. And he seeks God's throne. He seeks to be God on earth. He even titles himself Vicar of Christ, which literally means replacement of Christ. No other king, certainly none of the ten at the time of the rise of this little horn, ever made the claim that they were sitting in God's throne. Okay? What other defining characteristics? Well, he has an eyes like the eyes of a man. Okay? He's the overseer, the great all-seeing eye. And he looked, it, they even call it the Holy See, S-E-E. -E. Okay? He has a look more stout than his fellows. Yes, the kings of the earth quake before the stare of the pope. The papacy has the power and has exercised the power throughout history to seat and to unseat kings. The kings of the earth quake in his presence. 
they wear black in subservience when they meet him face to face. They kiss his ring. They used to kiss his feet. That's just how the kings of the earth serve him. He has a look more stout than his fellows. Nobody ever bowed at the knee to the kings of the ten of the ten kingdoms into which the Roman uh, Empire fell. The Pope is the only one that warranted the kings of the earth to get down on their knees in subservience and kiss his feet. This is historical fact, well documented. He made war against the saints and prevailed against them. For 2,000 years he has made war against the saints of Almighty God. What other king on the earth can, can be attributed with that identifying characteristic? Not one. Okay? Again, he wears out the saints of the Most High, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. The saints were given into the Pope's hand to be persecuted, to be tortured, to be burned, beheaded, and their properties confiscated, their children taken into Roman Catholic nunneries to be raised Roman Catholic, and this occurred for a time, times, and a dividing of time. 1,260 years. Okay, we're going to further enumerate the history and the fulfillment of that prophecy, but certainly the papacy is positively identified now as the man of sin, the little horn that Daniel spoke about in chapter 7. Yesterday we concluded with another identifying characteristic of the little horn of Daniel, the little king of Daniel. It says the little horn would think to change times and laws, and if you're looking for where we are, we're near the middle of the page on page 7. If you're following along in the online copy of the, of the book, you'll find a link to it on my website, inquisitionupdate.org. The last paragraph before the middle of the page, it says the little horn would, quote, think to change times and laws, unquote. First of all, very careful use of the word think here. He thinks to change times and laws. Now, I'm not arguing. The papacy, the little horn, the little king in Rome, the Antichrist of the Bible, did indeed change times and laws. But who is the divine lawgiver? Is it the Pope? Does he have the power to change times and laws? Or did the creator of all heaven and earth declare himself the one who established times and laws. Yes, the papacy literally has changed times and laws in this world. But we're not to obey him if we belong to Christ. He says he thinks to change times and laws. And it says the papacy has changed both human laws and divine laws. We talked about yesterday. How the papacy in their catechism in the Roman Catholic Church has literally obliterated the second commandment. It no longer exists in the, in the, in the canon of uh, the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. And they split the tenth commandment into two so as to maintain ten in number. The second commandment forbids the bowing down and worshiping images and idols. Okay, You might call the Pope the greatest idol in world history that men bow down to and worship and obey, okay? Your, your faith is not determined by who you profess with your mouth because Roman Catholics profess Jesus Christ, but to whom do they bow? To whom do they obey? They follow his customs, his, cha his changes in the times and the laws. Their actions speak louder than words. Their fruit bears witness who they belong to, what tree they belong to. They belong to the papal tree, right? Okay? Or they would repudiate the papacy's self-claimed power to change times and laws, and they would adhere to God's times and laws, would they not? It's one thing to profess Jesus Christ. It's quite another to worship and obey a man, a little man, 
a little king in Rome. It's your, your God is determined by who you obey. Never mind who you profess with your mouth. The papacy professes Jesus Christ, yet he is the Antichrist. How can that be? History plainly makes it clear. He is the Antichrist. He presumes to be a uh, professed Christ, but he is against Christ. He's a counterfeit. Okay, He has to look so close to the true. He has to appear to be so close to the true uh, believer in Christ that he would deceive even the very elect if it were possible. But he serves his master in hell. Okay, he's not the vicar of Jesus Christ, the replacement of Jesus Christ on the earth. He is the replacement of Satan himself on the earth. Strong language from Inquisition update, but that's my calling. Okay. In prophetic language, or rather, let, let me continue where we left off. The little horn would think to change times and laws. Okay, this is recorded in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And it says the papacy has changed both human laws and divine laws. You mo did you know for the last, one of the latest books we read here on Inquisition Update, uh, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, shows us how the papacy rules us through the civil laws of our land. The papacy makes us bow down and worship him by obeying the laws of our land, which are simply Roman Catholic canon law. They make us all subject to the papacy through the passage of civil laws in this land. Okay? James A. Wiley said exactly the same thing. Rome, uh, Roman civil liberty. It is by the gathering together in synod of the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church where legislation is drafted. It is taken from there to the Jesuit and Roman Catholic colleges and universities, the law departments, where it is put in legal language. It is then submitted to the papacy for signature, for, for approval, and then it's introduced into the House and the Senate for approval in the civil laws of the Washington, D.C., Okay, that's how Rome makes us Catholic, without our knowledge. We dutifully think we understand Rome, uh, Romans chapter 13, and we must obey the civil power. And uh, we do, oh Lord, we do. We obey the civil power as he is an instrument of, uh, for righteousness for God on the earth. But that's not at all what it is. Romans chapter 13 speaks of a godly government. A godly government we are to obey. Okay. It gives the jurisdiction of a godly government, the Ten Commandments, or rather the last six commandments. The first four are the domain of God altogether. Okay, The first four commandments are God's jurisdiction. The jurisdiction of the civil power is the last six commandments, those having to do with the relationship of man to man. Those having to do, the, that is the fourth command, the, four, the first four commandments have to do with the God, man's relationship to God only. That's God's jurisdiction. God has delegated to man's jurisdiction the, the last six commandments. They're named in Romans chapter 13. Okay? And we are to obey a godly government. But what about an ungodly government? Are we to obey an ungodly government that makes us Roman Catholic through the civil laws of the land, that makes us worship Antichrist through the civil laws of the land? That's not what Romans chapter 13 says. Okay? We're given in Romans chapter 13 what a legitimate godly government is. And we are to obey the civil power if it be a godly government. But it's not a godly government that adopts laws and traditions and holidays and the changing of the times and the changing of the laws that, are com that come from the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition. You're never going to hear this in any church. They don't teach this in the churches. They teach we are to dutifully obey the government. Okay? 
They're liars. They don't understand Revelation or Romans chapter 13 at all. They don't understand. How do they, if they say that we are to blindly obey the civil power, the civil laws of this land, how do they explain Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked right at Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, pointed their finger at his nose, and said, We will not bow down to your image. God is able to save us from the burning flames. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image. Now, if the shepherds behind the pulpits in the once Protestant churches were still teaching the truth, they would tell you, you have a divine obligation to obey the civil power so long as it is a godly government. Nebuchadnezzar was not a godly government. He commanded all the people to bow down to worship a golden image, and God's men would not bend, they would not bow, and they did not burn. But they came out of the flames without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. That's the example I want to follow. That's the example I want God's people to follow. And each and every one of us should be pointing our finger in the nose of the king of this land and say, we will not bow down to the Pope's image. Your laws, your Roman Catholic canon laws aren't worth the paper they're printed on. Okay, you sponsor nothing but Roman Catholic canon law. We are not under Roman Catholic canon law. We have no obligation to obey your laws. Well, Tom, you're talking about rebellion. No, I'm talking about obedience. Obedience to the only godly government in the, in the, in the universe. That's God's government. Look, I told this to my doctor one time. I said, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. You understand that, Doc? Yeah. Well, then what is a government of men? And I saw the light go on in his face. That's what we're all supposed to understand. There's no human government. When Jesus arrives, and Daniel describes this too, the return of Christ, he described all the kingdoms of the earth in the metal man image, the head of gold, the, the, the bronze, the silver, the, the, the two legs of iron and feet of iron and miry clay. Those are the governments of men from Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon right through the Medo-Persian Empire, right through the Greek Empire, right to the fourth and final empire on the earth, the Roman Empire, and when Christ returns, it's described as the mountain of the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. In other words, no human hand has touched it. It's divine. It's Christ, the rock. And he smashes that image in the feet. And not only does he destroy the feet, but he de destroys the legs, the thighs of bronze, the breast of silver, the head of gold. It's all ground to powder and it blows away with the wind. In other words, every human government will be destroyed because none of them were capable of bringing in Christ's righteousness. That is the fourth and final kingdom on the earth, now governed and controlled by the Pope of Rome, the Antichrist, the false Christ, will be utterly destroyed. Now, if our government, the government of the United States, is the servant of the Pope and it passes Roman Catholic canon law through the civil laws of this land and makes us all worship the Antichrist without our knowledge, without our approval, then are we to obey it when it's going to be destroyed? Does anybody have a better interpretation of Daniel's prophecy? I'd like to hear it. Tom, you're, you're, you're preaching rebellion. You're preaching sedition. I'm preaching obedience to the rightful king. Not the little king, the big king. 
Daniel correctly identified this little horn, this little king, with eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great blasphemies against the Most High and wearing out the saints of the Most High. Are you wore out? Are you fighting the Antichrist? Or are you obeying him dutifully like every good red-blooded American law-abiding citizen? You wore out. The Protestant Reformation... Once they understood the papacy was the Antichrist, then they automatically realized that their king of their country was a servant of the Antichrist. And they overthrew those kings and proclaimed the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the only true king of kings and Lord of lords is Jesus Christ. They're all to obey him, not the pope. Not the little horn. And still, I can hear you. Tom, you're talking rebellion. You're talking sedition. You're talking mutiny. You're talking anti-patriotic. Again, I'm telling you, I'm preaching obedience to the only lawful king in the universe. The one who is inheriting the earth and giving that inheritance to us who obey him and not the little horn in Rome. Am I making sense now? Am I making sense now? And when will you ever hear this preached from any pulpit behind any church in this country? They all preach, you've got to do your patriotic duty and go to the polls and vote. Which representative of the Antichrist do you want to be president of the United States? Donald Trump? Hillary Clinton? Take your pick. You know what? I didn't burn one drop of gas going to the polls because I know who the kings of the earth serve. They do not serve Christ. They serve the Antichrist. And they are making war against me every day by forcing me to obey Roman Catholic canon law. And they call me unpatriotic if I don't. You know what the root of the word patriotic is? the patrimony of St. Peter. If it weren't for the papal declaration of being the patron of the Christian world, there would be no such word as patriotism. You're only a patriot if you defend, protect, and preserve the patrimony of Peter which the papacy solely possesses, according to the papacy. You're never going to hear that from a pulpit, are you? The patrimony of Peter. That's who you're protecting when you form yourself into a patriot. I don't claim the name patriot. I'm loyal to my Savior, the one who died for me, the one who's coming to raise me to new life and make me an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. All other governments will be destroyed. We'll be back right after this. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And if you wish to do something for me, get down on your well-polished knees and pray. Pray until God lets you stand on your feet. The truth comes hard, and it's fraught with peril. It's fraught with persecution. All of history makes that perfectly clear. And the righteous suffer persecution. Please pray for me. Now we'll continue. Now that we understand that all human governments are destined to fail because of Daniel's prophecy. Plainly, it is laid out for us that all the governments of this world will soon become the government of our Christ. They've all failed. They're all anti-Christ. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's not one righteous government in the world because they're all run by men, deceived men, who convert Roman Catholic canon law into the civil laws of this land and make us rebel against Christ. And who is this little king? He changes times and laws, and it says the papacy has changed both human laws and divine laws. It has annulled and abrogated the laws of the kings and the emperors of this world, and relatively recently, in 1870, it had the audacity to declare itself infallible in defiance of the Scripture. Look, that's what it takes to make Christians obey Roman Catholic canon law. They have to stand up and declare themselves infallible. The most ridiculous assertion since Satan destroyed Adam and Eve. It's a lie. The Pope has no righteousness. The Pope has no infallibility. 
He's not the representative of anything holy. Even his priests are pedophiles. Come on! Surely you cannot believe that the papacy represents anything having to do with the God of creation. And the proof is that he stood before the world at, Vatic at the first Vatican Council in 1870 and declared himself infallible. You know, that didn't even sit well with Roman Catholics. They repudiate it to this day, many Roman Catholics. They like to equivocate, you know. They've learned the lesson of their Jesuit handlers. Well, he's only infallible when he speaks about faith and morals. Do you know what faith means? Anything having to do with the spiritual realm. That's what the Pope is infallible over, okay? You know what morals represents? when they say that the Pope is only infallible when he speaks ex, ex cathedra about spiritual things and moral things. Spiritual things is everything having to do with quote-unquote religion, and morals has to do with everything else. Okay? We learned that from R.W. Thompson. We learned that from... James A. Wiley, in, in the, the way Rome interprets its own language, when they say, when they seem to equivocate, well, the Pope's only infallible when he speaks ex cathedra, when he speaks about spiritual things and moral things, what they're really telling you is confirming what I'm telling you. The Pope is supreme over everything. Because what doesn't fall under the spiritual realm falls under the realm of morals. So don't be deceived. Rome's frank about what spiritual things and moral things represent. It represents all things. Rome doesn't contradict herself. She just changes in the way she expresses herself. Her meaning never changes. The Pope is as it were God on earth. Now who do you think the governors in Washington, D.C. obey? Because they have, everything they have to do has to do with morals, doesn't it? That's everything but the spiritual. That's left to the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. But the morals are left to the governors of the world at every level, not just Washington, D.C. Look, if you're going to take a public office and presume to be a governor in the world, you have to obey your pope. You have to obey the civil laws of this land. You have to worship the pope. In everything you think, do, and say, or you don't have to be informed who you're worshiping, but you have to you have to conform, or you'd be thrown out of office. A true Protestant wouldn't make it a day in Congress. That's what I'm telling you. A true Bible believing Protestant wouldn't last a day in any public office in this country. Because they would do what Tom Fress does, repudiate all the civil laws of this land as having originated from that little horn, that little king in Rome that Daniel talked about. Well, Tom, you're not saying that speed limits are unlawful. No, I'm not saying that speed limits are unlawful. We need to do what God said. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Don't put your neighbor in jeopardy. If 25 miles an hour puts your neighbor in jeopardy, then you ought to drive 20. That's the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Thou shalt not kill. Who do we worship and obey? Rome has wiggled her way into, the, into our hearts as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We obey all of his laws. But it goes much deeper than that. Much, much deeper than that. <clears throat> the papacy has presumed to annul marriages and to ordain celibate priesthood in the place of the biblical model of married pastors. He's contrary to the law of God. Okay? He puts himself in the seat and the throne of God on the earth. And he runs roughshod all over God's law. Institutionally, the Roman Catholic Church violates all ten of God's commandments. Institutionally. By law. Every one of them. The Roman Catholic canon law says the Pope may dispense with the laws of God altogether. And he has! He says, not only laws, but also times have been changed. The calendar of Pope Gregory has replaced the calendar of Emperor Justinian. I'll tell you what, 
he makes the point that a pope overthrew the calendar of the Roman of the Roman Emperor Justinian. Not one word mentioned about God's calendar. That's where the error lies. Justinian had no more authority to make a calendar than than Antichrist Pope Gregory. It was God who laid out the calendar in the months of the years. Did he not? Absolutely. He taught us how to reckon time. Well, nobody hears that anymore. No, nobody we wants to talk about it. Oh, Tom, come on. That's the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. Well, where was Justinian when the New Testament was written? Where was Pope Gregory, Antichrist Pope Gregory, when the New Testament was written? And when did God change any time or any law? I shall not alter a thing that goeth forth from my mouth, said God. He's not a man that he should make a mistake. But nobody reckons time the way God reckoned time in the Bible. Nobody anymore. Now, we can talk about the Julian calendar, the Justinian calendar, the Gregor, Gregor, Gregorian calendar, but nobody mentions God's calendar. That's how far lost it's, it's become. Who do we worship? We say we believe in God, we worship God, but who do we obey? Is your God determined simply by who you profess with your mouth or by who you obey? Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who they obeyed. He says there are all uh, there are all the many different saints' days within the Roman Catholic Church. You say all the Protestants don't they don't they don't uh, observe the uh, saints' days of the Roman Catholic Church. How many Protestants obey uh, and observe Valentine's Day? You know that's a date that's given to. The Roman Catholic Saint Valentine, the patron saint of lovers. Oh, Tom, you're being too, you're being, you're nitpicking. No, I'm not I'm telling you the truth. You observe the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church only when you observe Valentine's Day. You know, some of my listeners are going to say, oh, now Tom's talking hate now. He's talking against love. So he must be talking hate, right? You've got to be kidding. I just told you we are to love one another as we love ourselves. Drive carefully. Don't hurt anybody. If 25 miles an hour is too fast, drive slower. You don't want to kill one of God's saints. And then you turn right around and call me a hater because I preach against Valentine's Day. It's a Roman tradition. It's an Antichrist tradition. You know, there's only one in the universe that can declare a day holy. That's number one the only one that's holy anywhere in the universe. Number two, he's the only one that created a day. And if God didn't call it holy, trust me, it's not holy. And you can't take a pagan tradition and call it holy and expect an all-holy God to, ob to ob obey it and observe it and give honor and reverence to it and sanction it. You can't take a pagan holiday out of the Roman Catholic Church and baptize it and call it holy. It's not a holy day. Valentine's Day isn't a holiday. There's Columbus Day. You know what marks Columbus? He was he was he answered the call of the papacy to search out all lands for Christ, for the Pope. Christopher Columbus came to this hemisphere to conquer this land for the Pope. He made the papacy the king of this country, the king of this hemisphere. His ship bore the papal flag, for pity's sake, the flag of Antichrist. And what did he do? What Roman Catholic uh, uh, explorers have always done. They 
force upon the native people of the land Roman Catholic canon law, and they expect the people to worship the Pope and obey him and serve him. And if they didn't, they do what Christopher Columbus did, lop off their head, burn them, hang them, boil them, slay them, do anything you can to get control. And that's what Christopher Columbus did. You know our government makes all public employees observe Christopher Columbus Day? They're being made Roman Catholic without their knowledge. Observing Christopher Columbus is to observe the papacy and the inquisition that they brought to this hemisphere through Christopher Columbus. But look at the days that the author mentions. He mentions saints days. I just named one. There are so many you can't even count them all. But look what he says here. He says, and we have both Christ's Mass, Christmas, to celebrate the Lord's birth. Do you know there's not one mention in the Bible of the day Christ was born? Christians all over the world already acknowledge and have for years and years and years, December 25th cannot be the date of Christ's birth. You can just mark that one out. can't possibly be. Because... Jesus was born in the fall of the year, probably in October, September, October. What we call September and October. Right about the Feast of Tabernacles. A holy day. A truly holy day. Because it was God who established the Feast of Tabernacles. Did he not? You know what? It was holy then, it's holy now. And it probably marks very, very closely the date of the birth of our Savior, but there's not one mention in all the Bible what day that was. Why? Because we're not supposed to venerate his birth at all. The, the Scripture plainly lays out how he was born in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, born to a virgin in, the, in, in, uh, in Beth, Bethlehem. Okay? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the inheritor of all heaven and earth, was born in a lowly manger. Why? Because this wasn't his kingdom. He had to be worshipped first as a king. He had to be made a king by his father when he raised him from the dead. He's the king now. Trust me. He's the king. And all kings of this earth are going to bend their knee to him and him alone. And they're going to have to give an account for how many centuries they have obeyed the little horn in Rome. The little king. With the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great blasphemies against the Most High. Wearing out the saints of the Most High. They're going to have to give an account how in the papacy's behalf they killed the saints of Almighty God for 2,000 years. They're going to give an account to him and him alone. Every eye will see him, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord. And guess what's going to happen to the Lord that they served for 2,000 years? While they were professing Jesus, they served the Antichrist. Guess what's going to happen to him? He'll be cast in the lake of fire. All of a sudden, their king is going to go up in smoke. Their little king, their little horn in Rome is going to go up in smoke in a lake of fire that is reserved for him, the false prophet, Satan himself. Now you see why I say your God isn't determined by who you profess with your mouth, but by who you obey. Who did they obey? But the Pope in Rome. And that's who they serve. And that's who they'll be counted with. Michael de Samuelin doesn't go into it too much, but you can tell he doesn't think much of Christmas. We observe Christmas, the merry mass of Christ. Mass means killing. The merry killing of Christ. That's what it represents. It's not even hidden anymore. You can do a Google search for the, the origins of Christmas and find out for yourself. This is accepted by the, by the leaders of the Christian world. They understand this is no holy day. 
but they leave you in your error because they don't want to offend you. You can't pay the light bill for the church if you all leave. Okay? Darkness is coming over your sanctuary anyway. You just as well leave. Christmas. We use that to celebrate our Lord's birth. There's no commandment to celebrate His birth. We're made alive in His death. That's where we celebrate. Okay? And he says, and the pagan goddess has start day's festival, Easter, for his death and resurrection. The very day we're supposed to celebrate as our salvation, the day of our salvation, when his grave was found empty, we call that Easter today. And it is nothing but an ancient pagan celebration of the ancient goddess Astarte. Simiramis. Okay? The mother goddess, the queen of heaven. How, 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 can, how can Christians today observe these pagan holidays and call them Christian? Call them holy days when God didn't ordain them? The scriptures don't defend them? They're, they're, the history of these days are marked by paganism? How can you baptize a pagan ritual and call it holy? Well, Tom, you're tearing at the roots of Christianity. No, I'm not tearing at the roots of Christianity. I'm tearing at the roots of apostasy. Apostasy. Michael DeSemlian thinks the same of Christmas and Easter as I do. He's a bearer of the truth. But notice, he makes no mention at all the Sabbath here. The unholy trinity of pagan Christianity is Christmas, Easter, and Sunday, the first day of the week. Oh, there you go, Tom. You're preaching Seventh-day Adventism again. No, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. Six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and on the seventh day he rested. And he commanded all of us, before there was ever a Jew, before there was ever a Gentile, he commanded all mankind to observe the seventh day. And that's not Sunday. I'm tired of the accusation that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. People just want to pigeonhole me and call me a cultist because I believe in the Seventh Day. Well, your accusation won't hold water. The Scripture plainly says the Seventh Day. Jesus observed the Seventh Day when He went to the temple to read. And there's no account anywhere in the Bible that Jesus changed the Sabbath. No account. And the apostles clearly, Paul in particular, observed the Sabbath day. The Jews heard the, 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 the blessing on one Sabbath. The Gentiles demanded that they hear the truth on the following Sabbath. The Gentiles were observing the seventh day. The Scripture upholds the seventh day. A careful and purposeful reading of the New Testament reveals nobody observed the first day of the week. Neither Jew nor Gentile, if they were believers. Of course, the Jews, by law, observed the, sev the seventh day. The Gentiles followed their lead. It was God's law. But what does the whole Christian world observe today? The first day of the week. The venerable day of the sun. It has never been the mark of God's people. The roots of apostasy. Michael DeSemlian doesn't even dare bring this subject up in his book. He'd be labeled a Seventh-day Adventist, a cultist, and nobody would read his book, would they? Well, you can say what you want about Seventh-day Adventists. I've got plenty to say, too but they observe God's holy day. 
It's holy. God sanctified it, blessed it, called it holy. It's a, been a blessing to God's people for 6,000 years. A heavenly reminder of the Sabbath rest that will come when His King, His Son, comes to redeem us all. And for a 1,000 years, we will rest under His governorship only. Satan will be bound for a thousand years and we will get to rest finally. The seventh day. It's holy. It's a day of rest. I don't work on the seventh day. Not even on First Amendment radio. I rest and I think ahead to the promise that God made me. I will no longer toil just to have my labor stolen by the kings of this earth. The ground will yield bounteously for me. Everything I touch will turn to gold in a manner of speaking because Christ will bless it all. For a thousand years, God's people are going to enjoy peace finally. And plenty, finally. And no one will steal. No one will take from me under false pretenses. Nobody will enslave me to anti-Christ laws. And I'll finally, for the first time in my life, know what it is to live under a righteous king. Christmas and Easter and Sunday are the way the Pope, the little horn, the little king changed God's laws. Take it to the bank. He has nothing to do with Christ. He has everything to do with his father in hell, Satan himself. And he deceives the whole Christian world. I'll no longer be a part of it. He may be able to cast me into the lake of fire or the, the fiery furnace, but my God can deliver me, and even if he doesn't, I will not serve that little horn of Daniel any longer. Come back tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.